Hello, this is Kerry Turner in the Medical Division, and today we're going to review bloodborne pathogens and how to prevent an exposure. Also, we're going to review policy 06-36B, which is the exposure policy that was just updated. And at the end, there's going to be a short 10-question quiz. So let's begin. Again, we're going to talk the basics of bloodborne diseases, exposure prevention, and then the quiz. So, can we contract a disease at work? Well, unfortunately, the answer is yes. But we're going to do everything possible to prevent one. Let's briefly discuss what a bloodborne pathogen is. So, what exactly is a bloodborne pathogen? Well, they are pathogenic microorganisms present in the human blood that can lead to diseases like HIV, Hep B, and Hepatitis C. We all know what HIV is, and from this slide I do want to point out the third bullet point. HIV does not survive well outside the body. And then the last bullet point states how we can contract HIV. Here this next slide talks about hepatitis B and the symptoms. The last bullet point is also very important, where hepatitis B can survive for at least one week in dried blood. This is why it is so important to wear at least gloves when you're cleaning up after a scene, like a cardiac arrest, a big trauma, or a big traffic accident. Here discusses hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is the most common chronic bloodborne infection in the United States. Again, BSI. Here it just goes over the potentially infectious bodily fluids that you can review. And briefly, this next slide covers the transmission routes. Okay, needle sticks. First and foremost, no matter what precautions we take, accidental needle sticks will happen. That being said, if this ever does happen, we have now given you the tools to take care of the situation. One bullet point the medical division chief wanted me to point out is never ever do a pat down on a patient. Have Salt Lake City Police Department come and do a pat down on a patient. They have the option to purchase puncture resistant gloves or we don't have them. So please, if you ever need to do a pat down on a patient, have police do it. We've been told here in the medical division there are IV drug users out there that will purposefully use IV drugs, go ahead and take the needle, put it in their pocket, and go ahead and bend the needle straight up so when we get there or police gets there to do a pat down, then we get poked or PD gets poked. It's very unfortunate, but again, please have the police do pat downs on patients, not us. Okay, these next few slides um, is the basic review on just basically wearing BSI. Here's a great comment, the first bullet point. Treat all blood and bodily fluid as if it is contaminated. If we think this way all the time, then wearing proper BSI will just become second nature. some more things protective equipment it's been pounded in our heads but again this is a great review okay now let's talk about the two types of germicidal wipes we carry as we can see the red top takes a minimum of at least three minutes for maximum effect when we're cleaning off equipment tools so on and so on. The third bullet point here is important. Please do not use these for your skin and always wear at least gloves while you're using these red top wipes. Here you can see it kills HIV, Hep C, Hep B, and H1N1, the swine flu. The blue top is okay for skin use. 
but please um, use these wipes um, just for your skin. Um, this does not take place of a good hand washing though. Here we're just going to go over safe work practices that we all know. It's a good review. The rest of this presentation is going to focus on what responsibilities the firefighter has and the roles and responsibility the officer has in reporting and the steps to take after an exposure. Let's discuss what a significant exposure is. Employees exposed to blood or bodily fluids, solids from a source patient. To be considered a significant exposure, the employee must be exposed through contact with broken skin, mucous membrane exposure, or by a skin puncture, hence needle stick. Here's the employee's responsibilities. If an exposure ever happens, notify your supervisor immediately. We're going to go ahead and report to the University Medical Center, ER, U, the U of U, as soon as possible. We're going to contact Corvell. Here's a phone number listed here. Number two bullet points, probably the most important in this whole entire presentation. Hopefully nobody ever gets exposed, but if you do get an exposure, do not ever consent to a blood draw. If you have any questions or comments, please direct them to Division Chief Mike Fox. We're going to go ahead and fill out form number 350. We're going to go ahead and follow the treatment recommendations provided by the staff at the University of Utah. And then we're going to follow up again with the Medical Division Battalion Chief. Officers' responsibilities. First and foremost, respond with your employee to the U and ensure that they receive medical care. Go ahead and contact dispatch and have them make exposure notifications per policy 06-36B. At the end of this presentation, I went ahead and copied the policy so you can review the policy. And I also put a spreadsheet um, so you can go ahead and, and see what you need to do in case there is an exposure. Chief Fox wanted me to point this out as well. If one of your employees or one of you, an officer, supervisor, gets an exposure, due to the possible psychological aspects, the supervisor should encourage the employee to contact a member of the peer support or EAP. The source patient. We need to ensure that the source patient is transported to the hospital, UMCER if possible. Also, sending a crew member to the ER with the source patient is highly recommended. We're going to go ahead and notify the ER staff of the exposure and advise them of the need for a blood draw on the source patient. The on duty battalion chief or their designee is to go to the ER where the source patient is located to facilitate the blood draw. A copy of the state form 350 may be required by the hospital prior to performing the blood draw. These next few slides I went ahead and took from the CDC. Um, great information. Here's on hepatitis B. Tells you what your exposure rate is if you are have a needle stick or if you've been exposed. Hepatitis C. There's a lot of that out there. Based on limited studies, the estimated risk for infection after a needle stick or a cut exposure to to a hepatitis C infection, infected blood is only approximately 1.8%. Here it talks about HIV. The average risk for HIV infection after a needle stick or a cut exposure to an HIV infected blood is only 0.3%. About 1 in 300 
Stated another way, 99.7% of needle sticks cut exposures to HIV-contaminated blood do not lead to infection. But we're still going to prevent all of this. Okay, that was a down and dirty. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me here in the medical division. And I thank you for your time. Have a great day.